Tony Broom Ministries now brings you another teaching session from God's Anointed Word. Our scriptures come from Ezra, chapters 9 and 10. The title is, Return to God's Way. Our session this week is, Return to God's Way. Reminded me of my boyhood. I guess you could say, in, this week I returned to my boyhood. My baby bought me some Boston baked beans. And it's not beans you go to Boston to bake with. It's good old candy. And I'll tell you what, Pop and I were talking about Boston baked beans and how much we liked them. And we came to the conclusion that they taste the same way they did 50 years ago. But they're harder now than they were then. Or we came to the conclusion maybe they're not any harder as our teeth. I believe it's our teeth that's different now than were then. Anyway, you think about going back and you think about things that you like and you think about things in the past. A lot of things in the past you don't like, but there are things in the past that we enjoy too. And sometimes we can find them again and bring them back out or get some more of them and it's really nice. Like a bazooka bubble gum. Who can chew bubble gum now without pulling your teeth out? Of course, Medicare don't think that older people need any teeth. Something wrong with that picture. Return to God's way. God forgives those who repent. That's a short statement. It's about five words. But it really says a whole lot. God forgives those who repent. He doesn't say, well, let's see. Look at my ledger here. This is about the 14th time you've done this. He doesn't say, well, I'll tell you what. Let's come back next week with a little more money. See if we can't get you in. He doesn't come and say, well, I was hoping you'd do some big thing for me before I would forgive you. God doesn't say any of that. He forgives those who repent. That means a nation, it means a group, and it means an individual. If we repent, and that's what our text verse, our golden text verse is 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank God that we can confess our sins to God and that He will forgive us, that He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This again is true for a nation, it's true for a group, and it's certainly true for an individual. We confess our sins to God. This verse was not given to sinners, even though certainly a sinner confesses their sin to God and they come to the Lord. The prayer of salvation, it might be something as simple as, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Or like the thief on the cross said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And God had mercy on him and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. And so, Ever how simple it may be, the prayer of repentance, the prayer of salvation. God hears us when we pray. But this verse was given to Christians. If we, Christians, confess our sins, now some Christians don't think they sin. You and I know better. They can't see their own sin, but we certainly can see. We don't judge them, but the tree bearing the fruit got the leaves on it. You can't help but notice the leaves when you... Walking down the sidewalk and riding down the road, you see the trees, and there in the yard, the trees have the leaves and the acorn or the fruit on the trees. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We confess that we know. He forgives us even of that which we do not know. Well, our main scriptures do not come from 1 John. From Ezra, we end the book with chapters 9 and 10. Ezra responds to Israel's unfaithfulness. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now when these things were done, that is, the temple vessels were accounted for and burnt sacrifices were offered. They had said that they would bring the golden vessels and the things, the articles, back to the temple in Jerusalem. And when these were accounted for and they offered burnt offerings to the Lord, when these things were done... The princes came to me, that is Ezra, saying, The people of Israel and the priests 
and the Levites have not separated themselves from the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Now, I love God's Word, and I know God's Word is inspired, and I know God doesn't make mistakes, but I believe the Lord forgot one group. You know, you got the Perizzites and the Jebusites and the Moabites and the Ammonites and Amorites and all this. He forgot the electrolytes, all right? <laughs> got everybody else said them. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. This is something that God had said in the law. I want you to keep yourselves away from the heathen, from the people of these lands. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your sons to their daughters. Do not take your daughters for their sons. Do not take them for your wives. Do not go in into them. Keep yourself separate from them. Because not just the racial thing, but even more importantly than that, they will turn away your hearts from following me, God said. I want you to serve me only. I do not want you to learn their cultures and to learn their ways and to do after their abominations. I don't want you to go after heathen practices and after heathen gods. This is what God had said. And, of course, the people did the very opposite of what God had said. And he says here that the princes, the leaders, have been chief in that trespass. They were the leaders in it. God help us when our leaders who were supposed to lead us into the ways of righteousness and holiness end up leading us individually and as a group into liberalism, into abomination, into defilement, into unholiness. And the leaders are the ones who set the standard. Now, a leader cannot make you do anything. Well, I suppose if you have a monarchy, you can. But as far as those who are volunteer, those who are part of the family of God, those who are part of the church, the leader cannot make you do something. But they can set the standard. This is the standard for righteousness and holiness. And you don't have to go by the standard, but you don't have to be used either. I mean, you have a choice. Do you want to live for God? And we ought to live for God whether we get to sing in the choir, whether we get to sing the special, whether we get to take up the offering, whether we get to sweep the floor, whether we get to do whatever. We should live for God just because we live for God. No matter whether you get to do anything or whether your name is in the bulletin, you know, they get mad if you put your name in the bulletin. Then if you don't put your name in the bulletin, they get mad about that. But that's not what we serve God for. It's what we can do. We serve God because of what He's done for us. And naturally, if you serve God, you'll get to do all these things. There's a whole lot of things to do. But this evil practice and these things that have been committed against the Lord and the leaders were the number one ringleaders in it. They drew the whole nation away from God. Instead of setting a standard for righteousness and holiness, they were the kingpins in taking the nation away from God. Verses 5 and 6, And at the evening sacrifice I rose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed to blush and to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespass has grown up unto the heavens. This is a serious situation. I cannot even blush. I blush to even lift my face up to you. I'm ashamed to lift up my face to you. This is another thing. Not only had the leaders been chief in leading the nation and the people away from God and committing this abomination, 
But it had gotten to the point where sin didn't bother the people anymore. They were just whatever. Nobody cringes. Nobody gasps. Nobody blushes. Nobody is upset because of sin. There was a time in America, not even the church, when you were out here in the world in general, there was a time when people feared to talk about certain things in public. They wouldn't talk about certain things in mixed company. They wouldn't do certain things on Sunday, the Lord's Day, whether you're in church or not. There was a general fear of God in our nation. And in a lot of cases, that is missing in our nation today. People don't have the fear of God that they used to have. And it shows, of course, on the brash going to hell media, on the television, on the radio, on the internet, the newspaper. People are just quick to speak against God. They don't have any hesitation whatsoever to blast the nation, to dishonor the flag, to undermine the office of the president and the high leaders. They have no problem at all dishonoring God, not standing during the national anthem, dishonoring the flag, pay no attention to veterans, people who have fought and laid down their lives so that we can have the freedom that we enjoy. They have no problem with desecrating. They demand rights, and yet they're not even legal. And they say, how dare you not stand up for immigration? After all, this nation was built. We immigrated. We came over here. Yeah, you can come over here, but you ought to come in the right way. You ought to be legal about it. We're passing the alternate lifestyle. We're passing legalization of drugs and marijuana, and then we wonder why everybody turns out to be a bunch of fruitcakes. So we have our own things to deal with, just like Israel did. Verses 8, 10, and 15 is not in the printed text, but it's talking about the grace of God. What God had blessed them, and even during their times that they were turning against God, God had shown them His mercy. Now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in His holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. God has had mercy on us. He's given us a little grace. He's given us a grace space. He's given us a nail in His holy place. We've been in bondage. We've been in captivity. But now He's given us a nail in His holy place. He's given us a little reviving in our bondage. He's allowed us to come back to Jerusalem. He's allowed us to lay the foundation to build the temple again. God is having mercy on us. And now are we going to turn? And we're going to desecrate God? Are we going to go against Him? Now, O oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, O Lord God of Israel. Thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespasses, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. They were in bad shape, and they could not stand before God because they were so guilty of sin. And then the second part talks about lamenting and covenant making. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. Now this is connected to what I was talking about a few moments ago about sin not bothering us anymore and it not getting a hold of us. There was a time in the church where people wept and where people agonized with God, not that God was so hard to get along with, and it's because of sin, because of our loved ones who are lost. People are lost. And they're not lost because I say they're lost. They're lost because of the way they're living. If you have never received Christ, you're lost. If you've been a Christian and you've been away from God and you die in that condition, you'll die lost because just because you are 
once saved and once in church, that doesn't automatically guarantee that you'll just never, nothing happen to you. We've got to live for the Lord. And we've got to serve God. And so here is Ezra. I mean, he is wailing. He's weeping. He's casting himself down before God. And there assembles this congregation of men and women and children. And the people wept very sore. This affected not only him, but it affected the people. There were people who had got the vision of this thing and who had read the law. The law had been read before them and they were convicted because of their sin. The people, that's the common man like me and you, the people in church today. Now, not all, but generally speaking, the people in church today, they want the Holy Ghost. They want the Word of God. They want the good things of God. They're excited about Jesus. They want the old-time religion. But there again, you got a few hobnobbers. you got a few liberal leaders who are just soft and souring, and they lead us away from God. And they're more pleasure-minded than they are spiritual-minded. And they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. It's so easy to get, what's that great big word, lackadaisical or whatever, lazy. It's just, and everybody likes lazy, boy. But you're not living that way. There's no time to get lazy, boy, on Jesus. Jesus could have sat up on that throne in heaven. He could have said, lazy, boy, I'm not going down there, bunch of rascals going to spit on me and put me on the cross, act like they don't know who I am. I'm not going down there for them. But he went all the way, and he never gave up. And he did it so we could be saved. Yes. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of my Lord, and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. Let it be done lawfully, according to God's law, and let this be done. You give the counsel, you give the advice, the Lord is with you, we'll follow you, we'll do what the word of the Lord says. Let this be done, and let the commandment be given, let the word go forth, and let us do what God wants us to do. And it's wonderful when you can see people respond to God and do what He says. Let us put away these strange wives, let us and there's so many things that those are the born of them, it says here. There was a Christian ministry, a radio ministry, if I'd call the name of it. Certainly some of you would know which one it is. But these people wrote to this radio ministry and they said, I've come to the Lord and I've received Christ into my heart and I've got three wives. Which one of them should I leave? Which one of them should I put away? It's hard to tell people what to do because people get themselves, and you know what I'm talking about, not just in a situation certainly, but just generally speaking, people get themselves, and I would say we get ourselves so wrapped up in mess in this world that you can't hardly get out of it. It is so entangling that's what the python of the devil wants to do. He wants to tangle you up and tie you up where you can't get out of it. We know that living in America now, well, people live the way they want to live, but legally you're not supposed to have but one wife. And this person came to Christ and they realized, I was supposed to have one wife, but I got three. Any, many, me, who's the one for me? I mean, which one, what shall I do? What about love? You can't just have a bunch of wives just because they did back in the old cultures and some people still do today. It's called polygamy. But there's love. God didn't build us that way. We're not built. You're not built to take 25 women, 25 men, and get on the bachelor or the bachelorette, say, any, many, mighty, mo, which one should I choose? I don't know. You can't do that. Nobody has the capacity to do that in a week. You cannot take yourself and choose a person in a week and expect to come out with anything. We're not built that way. 
Then arose Ezra and made the chief priests and the Levites and all the Israel to swear that they should do according to this word. And they swear. Confessions and separations. Ezra fasted and mourned because of the seriousness of the situation and the transgression of those that had been carried away. Proclamation was made to all the children of the captivity that they should gather themselves together at Jerusalem and deal with this matter. So here they are at Jerusalem. Thank God for Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a place to come. And they were judged and they went into captivity. But Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Jerusalem is the city of David. Jerusalem is the city where Jesus came and where he ruled. He was born in Bethlehem, but he is king. He will come to Jerusalem. He will rule and reign there. And then the new Jerusalem, you and I, will live in that new city called New Jerusalem. Jerusalem, yes, it is the capital of Israel. And I go on record in agreement with that. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. It's also the center of the kingdom. Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month, which is our December, on the twentieth day of the month, and all the people sat in the street of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and for the great rain. It was cold. That was a bad Christmas present, wasn't it? They didn't have Christmas then, but that's our Christmas time. Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed against the Lord. Ye have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure. Separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. So now they're dealing with their sin and it took a long time. Sometimes, as I said, you get so entangled, so tied up with things that it's not something you can do in a day or two. In fact, the scripture said here, this, this is a matter for not just one day or two. We've got to come at certain times. Our cities and our elders have to come according to the time prescribed and we have to deal with this matter until the fierce wrath of God turns away from us. We want a quick pill thing. Come on and put a little pill in your mouth. When it dissolves, everything is alright. Just come to the altar and say, Lord, forgive me. I don't have to live any different. Don't have to do any different. Don't have to make any changes. Just add a little Jesus on the band-aid to your life. Go on back out and live the way you always live. That's not the way you do it. That doesn't do anything. That's what we want. We want all the power and the glory of God, but yet we don't want to make any changes in the way that we live. That's not the way it's going to happen. We have to turn back, as the title says, return to God's way. We have to return to the old paths. That doesn't mean you have to wear wide ties. I mean, you know, this is not a wide one. Look at it. I had to tie it three times a day. Glory be. Three ties for me. Three times. But I finally got it right. And I'll tell you what. We need to turn back. Not to the great big wide ties and not to the old timey dresses of 1940. But we need to turn back to the ways of righteousness and holiness. We need to live for God. Because Jesus is coming back. And he's not coming back for no honky-tonking. He's not coming back for no swanking and drinking and stinking and hanking. He's not coming back for all that. He's coming back for a people who's right with God. And on fire for God and want to see people saved, born again, sanctified, baptized in the Holy Ghost and healed. There's so much wonderful things that we can do for God. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you, Lord, for the challenge that we have to deal with sin in our life and in our nation. Lord, I pray for our nation. I pray that you'd touch our nation. I pray that you'd touch our president, our vice president, our leaders. I pray that you'd touch our military. I pray that you'd touch our law enforcement. And I pray that you'd touch our communities and our families, that many people will be saved and born again and come to Christ and make him Lord of their life. In Jesus' name, amen. You have been listening to a teaching session from God's Anointed Word. The title has been, Return to God's Way. Make sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord. This has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.